Good morning. Happy Fourth of July to you. Yes, I am back. I am glad to be back. And uh, I hope I never have to go again. <laughs> it was nice to wake up someplace other than my own house. That was nice. It was nice to visit some uh, very uh, sweet people. And uh, But it's also, I missed you, you sweet people, last week from not being here. Once again, happy Independence Day. And let's open with a word of prayer. Our precious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for our independence here at this church. We do thank you that we don't have to answer to a, a diocese or a synod or, or anyone else other than you. We can worship you as you tell us to. And Lord, we are also glad we, we live in a country that allows us to do so, that we can preach and worship without fear of interference. Uh, with, uh, we can assemble here, Lord, and we are so grateful for that. May we never lose those rights, those privileges. And Lord, have your hand a blessing upon us during the next 45 minutes, Lord, during our communion time especially. Uh, be with us and uh, give me the words to say to bring encouragement and enlightenment to these kind people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The first song is number 574. It is called Revive Us Again, number 574. We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, by the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, by the glory, revive us again. We praise Thee, O God, for thy spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and banished our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has taken our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again. Did you catch what I was doing there? Cody, did you notice? I said amen for all of you who came from low churches, and I said amen for all of you who came from high churches. So that's just the kind of guy I am. I want, to, <laughs> I want everyone to feel welcome there. It is good to see you here this morning. We're going to do something different, and it shouldn't be different. We should do this from time to time. Our unison reading is actually the pledge to the American flag, being that tomorrow is the 4th of July. If you're unable to stand, don't feel badly about that. God understands. But if you can, if you're uh, comfortable standing, please stand with me as we uh, pledge our allegiance to the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. And you may be seated. The title of today's lesson is made up of nonsensical words, but there is no great mystery behind them. The title is, Four Witches Stand, One Naked, Under Guard, Individual. And this is how I, little Davy Greer, as a kindergartner, first learned to recite one of the lines of the Pledge of Allegiance. As I recited the, these words, I pictured Margaret Hamilton, the Wicked Witch of the West from The Wizard of Oz, 
along with her three sisters, standing over, standing guard over a naked person. I didn't question this. I didn't know what the words meant or why I was urged to recite them to our flag with my little hand over my little heart. But I was a good soldier. I obeyed. I did what the teacher instructed. I placed my right hand over my chest, faced the American flag, and announced proudly with the rest of my class, four witches stand, one naked under guard individual. But it wasn't too long after my first day of kindergarten that I discovered the proper words for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible. Now knowing the correct words didn't bring me any closer to understanding what we were doing or uh, any closer to the understanding of the true meaning of the pledge, it was still nonsensical to me with the exception of one word. As a little boy who never missed Sunday school, I was certain of the word God. You see, I knew all about God from an early age. I'm not saying I understood God. I still wouldn't dare make that claim today. Back then, I didn't know anything about his omniscience or his omnipresence or his omnipotence. All I knew, or all I thought I knew, was that God lived beyond the sky. He watched over me, and he loved me. And when it comes right down to it, that's all we need to know, right? I believe every little child is born with that knowledge. It, someone loves them and they're watching over them and that someone is God. I think it's because of education and peer pressure that we lose that sense that someone loves us and they're watching over us. But anyway, that's another sermon. So I guess that means that I knew God was over me. I guess that means I knew another word in that nonsensical pledge. I knew the word under. Under God. I got that. I get that now. I am under God. He is way up there. I am way down here. He watches over me, but I can't watch over him. He's too far beyond me, too far above me for me to see him. As I grew older, I learned that the word under has varying meanings. Under isn't just a word depicting physical location. It, it also can relay authority. I am under God. This means that I am under his authority. Like it or not, I work for him. He doesn't work for me. Like it or not, I answer to him. He doesn't answer to me. He is my authority. I am not his. That's how it is. Nobody asks my opinion. Nobody asks your opinion either. Nobody asks our permission. That's just how it is. Even though the Pledge of Allegiance begins with the word I, I Pledge of Allegiance, the Pledge isn't about me, is it? And it isn't about you either. Because there are two words that precede the words under God, and that are, that are the, those are the words, one nation. Our one nation is under God. And again, the word under can describe the physical positions of God, and of God regarding, in regard to this country of ours. Our nation is way down here. God lives way up there. It is an accurate way of thinking of things in this spatial, relative way. But I don't think that's what Reverend Francis Bellamy meant when he wrote the pledge in 1892, or, nor what President Dwight D. Eisenhower meant when he added the two words under God in 1954. The president knew, and surely the reverend must have known, that this country was and is under God's authority. One nation under God. That phrase sounds right to me, I must confess, I, but I do worry about two words in that phrase, and they may not be the words you would readily think of. I worry about the word one. Some say that we are not one nation anymore. Some say that our nation is now more divided than it has ever been. Our nation is of two minds. Oh, we've always had opposing opinions amongst ourselves, even way back before 1776 when this country was founded. But at least Americans seem to be working towards similar goals. We may have not all been on the same page, but at least we were reading from the same book. Now we have socialism versus capitalism. Now we have globalism versus nationalism. Some have pride in our nation versus those who find shame, nothing but shame in it. Some want to forge on with old ideals, while others want to dismantle those same ideals and rebuild this nation as something completely different. We Christians need to pray. That even though we have these opposing opinions as Americans, we will continue to strive toward the same goals of decency and, and being God-honoring and having God's blessing upon us. Let me quote you something. And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. Let me say that again. 
And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. You ask what great patriot said that? Jesus Christ said that. The other word I worry about in the four-word phrase, under one, God, one nation under God, is the word under. Under may be the most difficult word for some of us to digest and to accept. Many Americans, be they the highest politicians or the lowliest workers, struggle with the word under when it's in relation to God. Generally speaking, most people have no problem with the idea of God. Even atheists have no great concern if we silly Christians foolishly believe that there is a God. It is when we insist that we and they are under him, under his authority, that's when you see the sparks fly. Some of us have a great problem with the word under. God made us in his image, and then we turn around and try to make God in our image. But I assure you, we, you, I, all of us are under him. Whether we like it or not, and I know nobody asked our opinion and nobody asked our permission, that's just how it is, so we might as well accept it. Again, we Christians need to pray for this one nation. But before we do, let's do a self-check. In fact, this is a communion Sunday. We're supposed to be checking out ourselves and our spiritual standing. Have we accepted that we are under God's authority? We can't expect the country to accept that if we as individuals, as we as Christians haven't accepted that. Have we accepted that we are under God's authority? Have we so swallowed our pride? Have we bowed our hearts to God above before we pledge the our allegiance to anything including the flag have we pledged our allegiance to God it really all starts with us and that is the end of the lesson if there's nothing further let's take our hymnals and turn to page number 692 the battle hymn of the republic Doris picked this because tomorrow is uh, indeed the independence day number 692 the battle hymn of the republic Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. They have builded him an altar in the evening dews and damps. I can read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps. His day is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah, his truth is marching on. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea, with a glory in his being that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us live to make men free, while God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. 
His truth is marching on. Amen. Thank you very much. This morning we're going to begin our sermon time with a very well-known Bible story. At least it should be familiar to any of us who have, who have attended church for any length of time. I can't imagine that there is a pastor out there who isn't taught on this passage at one time or another. The familiar story I'm talking about is found in John chapter 8. Now, those verses aren't in your bulletin, but they are in the Bible in front of you. If you want to read along instead of listening along, that's fine. John is the fourth uh, chapter uh, f fourth book of the New Testament and of course the ch eighth chapter would be the eighth chapter but anyway Jesus is at the Mount of Olives and early on one particular morning Jesus goes to the temple and he begins teaching and even though it is in the early hours Jesus draws a crowd of eager people wanting to hear what he has to say while he's teaching all of a sudden Jesus teaching is interrupted by a group of scribes and Pharisees who just barge in. I mean, how rude. The scribes and Pharisees are a group of well-educated, very influential religious rulers. You would expect them not to be so impolite, but they are. They are there to make trouble for Jesus, and very rarely is this not the case. With them is a, in tow is a woman. The woman is most likely frightened and upset. They sit this woman in the midst of the crowd. The scribes and Pharisees stopped Jesus' teaching and they announced to him, Master, oh I hate when they call him Master, Master Schmaster, they don't mean it. Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Yikes, talk about a bunch of perverts. <laughs> talk about a bunch of peeping toms. Were they looking through keyholes or, or do, were they just setting her up? Were they entrapping her? Well, ugh. Anyway. It's funny they catch this woman in the very act of adultery. You know what I'm saying. Yet they bring her to Jesus alone. In short, it takes two to tango, and they only catch one of the dancers. I wonder what happened to the fellow with whom this woman was sinning with. 
Perhaps he's also a Pharisee. Maybe he volunteered his services to entrap this woman. That's just speculation because we're not told the specifics. But wanting to trick Jesus into showing disloyalty to the law, the scribes and the Pharisees remind him, now Moses in the law commanded us that such a woman should be stoned, but what sayest thou, master? I wouldn't go as far as to call the Pharisees stupid, but they are arguably short-sighted. They are blinded by their hatred of Jesus so much that they, you know, they consistently insist that Jesus has no authority, especially no authority over them. He's just a, a lowly son of a carpenter. Yet when they ask his ruling over this woman, they actually betray themselves by putting any importance on anything Jesus has to say. In asking for Jesus' verdict, they leave themselves open to criticism that they are shirking their own responsibilities. And in doing so, they're basically giving up their authority. It'd be sort of like if Judge Judy asked one of the cameramen to decide a case. Well, that cameraman has no authority. So they, 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 these, you know, they're not too bright, or they're just so blinded by their hatred that they're not seeing this. Anyway, they ask Jesus, you know, Jesus, we've heard you teach about mercy and forgiveness, but... We also heard you teach about obedience to the law. So which is it, Master Smarty Pants? Do we show mercy and pardon this lady and allow her to go unpunished? Or do we obey Moses' law and stone her? I know I state the obvious when I say, well, Jesus is no dum-dum. He knows that these men neither care about the law nor do they care about the life or the reputation of this woman. He knows their hearts are wicked and crooked. The scribes and the Pharisees are using this opportunity to expose Jesus as a hypocrite because he doesn't practice what he preaches. That's actually the, the layman's definition of a hypocrite. You've got to practice what you preach or you'll be a hypocrite. And what better way to expose him than to expose him in front of his disciples and this crowd of listeners? They're going to expose Jesus as a charlatan in front of the, an audience. I mean, how delicious is that? This is so delicious it can't be fat free. They just love this. They, they're salivating because they know if they can just expose one, just one inconsistency in his teaching, they could stop, put a stop to this whole silly ministry. This was their goal all along. And in case you missed it, let me explain a little further. Their plan is simple. Their logic is unflawed. The Old Testament Jewish law dictates in order to keep order when the Israelites were roaming the wilderness for 40 years, Adulterers were to be stoned to death. They had to keep order because everything they were doing was displeasing God. So the laws may seem very strict to us today, but there was a reason for it. You couldn't have some man going from tent to tent, uh, from woman to woman, and then there'd be like an, an eternal civil war between families during this time when they're trying to get God's blessing and pleasing him. So the laws were very, very strict. But Jesus has been teaching about mercy and forgiveness. If Jesus says to stone this woman, then his own words have not been sincere. However, if Jesus allows this woman to go free, he has just put his stamp of approval on her sin, thus showing no regard for Moses or the law. So the scribes and Pharisees needle him. They taunt him, what's it going to be, Jesus, stone or a forgiver? Speak up, we haven't got all day. Instead of answering them right away, Jesus stoops down and he begins using his finger as a pen on the ground. Now, we're not sure if they're inside the temple or outside the temple. He begins drawing or writing either in the dew of the marble floor or the dirt uh, outside the temple. And he, he doodles as if he doesn't hear them. Undeterred, the scribes and the Pharisees keep, keep demanding his answer, that he answer their question, should this woman be condemned or not? When Jesus is ready, or when he has finally just heard enough, Jesus stands up, he exposes what he has written, and replies, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Jesus then the stoops back down and continues etching on the ground. What is Jesus writing? I don't know, do you know? I don't know. <laughs> no one knows. Perhaps he is writing passages from Moses' law, uh, perhaps he's listing the sins of the scribes and the Pharisees, or perhaps he's just having himself a good old game of tic-tac-toe. We don't know, we're not told. But whatever he is sketching apparently convicts this woman's accusers. Maybe each accuser sees something different. Maybe Jesus is just 
doing circles or figure eights, I don't know. But maybe each accuser sees something different in Jesus' etchings. Maybe this is some sort of miracle that they all see their own sins being written down, even though it's just, you know, gibberish. This could be, after all, Jesus is the Son of God. He could do that, but we're not told. Again, I'm stating the obvious when I say Jesus is no dum-dum. He's the best. Do you notice he does not rebuke these men? He never says, how dare you, or who do you think you are? Nor does Jesus throw himself between the woman and her accusers in an effort to protect her from her due punishment. She did break the law. She is due punishment. In fact, Jesus doesn't even make a case not to stone this woman. He actually gives the scribes and the Pharisees his permission to stone her. But he adds one caveat. He answers them, yeah, go ahead and stone her if you must. But he that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. Wow, that was clever. He's no dum-dum. John 8, 9 then tells us, And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one. Boop, boop, boop. They started disappear, disappearing. They started shrieking, into the, uh, backing up into the shadows. Beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. Just Jesus and her. By the time Jesus stands back up from his doodling on the ground, the second time the scribes are gone, the Pharisees are gone. Even his disciples are gone. Those eager listeners who had come to hear Jesus early that morning, they're gone. They all left because they got the message. Whether they liked it or not, they understood what Jesus was implying. Not implying, saying. The message hit home. The message is this, that they are no better, no more sinless, and no less sinful than this woman. They have no right to condemn this woman because they are all worthy of condemnation. You know, judge not that you be not judged. If they condemn her, then they are hypocrites. The Pharisees came to expose Jesus as a hypocrite. But Jesus turns tables on them and exposes every one of the woman's accusers as hypocrites. And the realization of being a hypocrite and the guilt that comes with that makes them each all disappear one by one into the shadows. I have found that the accusation and the realization of hypocrisy is a mighty powerful thing. In many people's minds, being called a hypocrite is the dirtiest of insults. In my years of ministry, I've heard people proudly declare, well, I don't bother going to church because I'm no hypocrite. Yeah, I'm a liar and a cheat and a sinner, but I'm no hypocrite. I'm not going to go to church and pretend that I'm all holier than thou when I know I'm not. I've heard other people proudly proclaim, oh, I'm not interested in going to your church in the least. That place is full of nothing but hypocrites. I can't argue with that we are. This church, <laughs> including this pulpit, this church is full of hypocrites, but then so is the bank, so is every store, so is the gas station, and so is your home. Unless you're not there, <laughs> then it's empty of hypocrites. We are all guilty of hypocrisy, and that's the real message behind this story. You know, I, I hearken back, I remember the first time I ever heard the word hypocrite and understood the meaning of the word hypocrite. I was just a little boy. And there was a story going around about a woman who received a strongly worded letter accusing her of drinking too much and dressing indecently and being, in pro, being in, inappropriate with all sorts of men and just generally being an unfit mother. Incensed by this Letter, the woman decides that she's not going to take these accusations lying down. The woman has moxie. This woman is no shrinking violet. She walks right up to her accusers and tells them that they are nothing but Harper Valley hypocrites. That's right. This widowed woman of a teenage daughter in her miniskirt named Mrs. Johnson accused the members of the Harper Valley PTA of everything they accused her of. How dare they point their fingers at her when they are guilty of the very same sins, if not even worse sins than she ever committed. Boy, that day, let me tell you, that mama socked it to the Harper Valley PTA. But I digress. Now, if I may be so bold, what Jeannie C. Riley missed in her famous song, and what some pastors miss when they tell this story in John chapter 8 is this, just because our accusers are just as guilty as we are, that doesn't make us any less guilty. Just because everyone in Harper Valley is a promiscuous drunk doesn't make Mrs. Johnson a fit mother. 
She still needs to settle down, lengthen her skirt, send her gentleman callers home, and be a decent example for her teenage daughter. Despite whether her, her hypocritical accusers are present or not, the woman in John 8 is still guilty of running around with men and going wild. That's a lesson there for us. Just because everyone else purposely forgets to scan an item in the self-checkout lane doesn't make our theft any more excusable. Just because everyone else lies on their taxes doesn't make our lies any more acceptable. Just because everyone else rolls through the stop sign doesn't make our disregard of the law any more forgivable. And most importantly, just because everyone else foolishly believes that they are okay and they mistakenly believe that they don't need a savior doesn't mean that we can get by without him. When it comes to salvation, there is no safety in numbers because we will all one day stand before God as individuals. Let's get back to our story. John chapter 8 verse 10 tells us, When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? You know, where's it, where'd everyone go? No one's, we're all your accusers, lady. Verse 11 says, she, he, she answers, she says, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Let's not mistake verse 11 for anything other than a happy ending to some very embarrassing, very cruel actions against this woman. I mean, to be drug out of bed, taken to a, the temple of all places, half-dressed, and to have her exploits exposed in front of a crowd of strangers, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. But Jesus does not condemn this woman, but he does judge her sins, and I think this is what's missed. He tells her to go and sin no more. He's recognizing that she is a sinner, that she has sinned. This woman does not get a pass. He doesn't say, oh, just forget about the whole thing. It's okay. Ah, uh, just go. We all make mistakes. No, her sin needs forgiven. Let me say that again. Jesus judges this woman's sins, but he does not condemn her. Jesus forgives her sins and allows her a second chance. Go, he says. Let's try this again. Isn't that nice? We mess up terribly, but yet we can go and tomorrow's another day. Today's another day for that matter. We can go and sin no more. This embarrassed woman leaves the temple better off than her accusers, for she has had her sins forgiven, washed clean, she leaves there debt free. The scribes and the Pharisees are still carrying around their sins. They still need their sins paid for. Jesus tells the woman to go and sin no more. So will this woman refrain from sinning the specific sin of adultery from here on out? I would like to think so. But will this woman remain sinless in general? No, I, I doubt that. Unless she dies just a few seconds after Jesus forgives her, she will eventually commit some other sin, just as we all will and do commit sins. As long as we are here on this earth, we will strive not to sin, sometimes with success and sometimes with failure. You see, we are all hypocrites. This hypocrite promises not to cast the first stone at you if you promise not to cast the first stone at me. Like the Lord's Prayer states, let's forgive each other of our debts. And with these things, I instruct you all to think upon these things during our communion time, which we're going to go into now. At this time, I'm going to invite Brother Cody Frick to the pulpit, and he's going to lead us in our communion reading. Please stand if you're comfortable and able to stand. Brother Cody. The Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Also, he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Amen. You may be seated. Please stand as we sing one verse of Blessed Be the Tie That Binds on page number 560 and remain standing for the Lord's Prayer.
Blessed be he the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. I'm going to invite Mrs. Linda Campbell to close our service with the Lord's Prayer. I hope you have a very happy 4th of July and a very safe one. And uh, sometime tomorrow, just be thankful for all the, the independence we have and the rights we have in this country to continue this church and building on God's uh, word. Uh, Miss Linda. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And thank you for coming. You are dismissed.